This is Philip Rostek speaking. This is part f part five of my life. And uh, last time we um, finished up by mentioning who my favorite artists were in around 1971-72, and I mentioned Bruce Nauman. I remember Bruce Nauman's fountain where he just um, kind of spit water up in the air and called himself a fountain. And I was particularly impressed by Dennis um, Oppenheim uh, and his piece called The Last Graphic Gesture of My Father, where he was trying to talk to his dad moments before his dad passed away. And on a pencil, he tried to write something, but it, it turned out to be just a gestural mark. And Dennis had um, uh, taken that mark and given it to a farmer who had a great big cornfield and who cut in into the cornfield um, a representation of those marks, of that mark, and then Dennis had it photographed from an airplane so that you could see that last graphic gesture of his father presented um, inside the organic growth of, of the corn. And I like that for a couple of reasons. The biggest reason that I liked it was that it was overtly autobiographical. And it was also concept art. And he had found a place between those two zones where I think, for me, he created something extremely masterful. Uh, my goal was to do something on the order of that with my own work. I so did um, uh, appreciate it. I used to spend a lot of time in my studio basement, and I was being influenced by by Jim Nelson and my friend um, Shalom Newman, uh, both of both of whom aspired very high in their aspirations. Everybody at Carnegie Mellon did. It was performance school. You were serious about making an impact in the world there. Uh, and I spent, uh, therefore, a lot of time at um, Hunt Library reading what was going on in the art world. And, and uh, I was pretty well informed um, during that period of time. Uh, and and uh, I spent a long time, uh, a lot of time, um, preparing myself for for what I would eventually try to do in my graduate work. In studying with, uh, well, I actually didn't pay for uh, for uh, sitting in on Robert Lepper's class. Uh, he didn't kick me out. Um, and I was, I was there every time that he had a class listening to what he was saying because um, I thought he was really smart and uh, I wanted to know stuff. And so I did learn stuff. And when it came to the retrospective uh, part of the class that I actually did take the following year, um, and it was it was overtly about autobiographical experience, finding out who you are. Um, he would uh, tell undergraduate students uh, a good point of departure would be trying to remember the house in which you grew up, and um, and um, uh, perhaps try to paint a room in the house, not going back and looking at it or referencing anything. Um, except your own memories and uh, what might be important is the salient things that you remembered and the things that you couldn't remember that wouldn't be very important um, anyway in talking to Mr. Lepper years later um, essentially it was about um, letting the subconscious take the initiative 
in your artwork. And um, I should mention that during that period of time uh, in Mr. Lepper's heyday, explaining why abstract art was inevitable uh, in America, um, it was a major thing that needed to be described by somebody. And um, because abstract art, what could it be? It didn't look like anything recognizable. And yet Mr. Lepper was able to describe that uh, from the standpoint of information per unit time, uh, intake per unit time. Um, the world was moving quicker. It required uh, summarization. And um, uh, when people said it didn't look like that, Mr. Lepper said, uh, the hell it didn't. Uh, and so he had um, the ability to explain things that confounded most people. And um, uh, the term analysis um, is the main word that is connected to, to Robert Lepper and his special capacities as an artist to uh, shed light on things that were opaque, even to smart people um, who, who tried to figure out what was going on in the world. He was good at it. Both uh, Mr. Lepper and Bruce Breland, um, in my opinion, had commonality in this zone. They both saw uh, art and life together as a unison. Uh, not to be separated into their separate boxes, but to take to take them on um, simultaneously, and um, that influenced me quite a bit, and it did bring credence to the fact that I wanted to do autobiographical work, not because I was just self-impressed. But I realized that my upbringing uh, during, during my childhood was rather special. And living in America in the 50s uh, that involved affluence that was um, unique, perhaps in the history of the world, was not to be uh, neglected. Um, taking the most obvious things uh, not for granted, but to taking taking them seriously was what Mr. Lepper uh, always advised. Do it without prejudice, without preconception, and try to get to the core of things was really um, what what he advised all the time. This was not a bad fit with uh, what I learned from Bruce Breland who was um, uh, not overtly um, uh, obsessed with uh, making artwork that was autobiographical, but he did suggest to people that uh, didn't know what to do, do something about their life as a point of departure. Um, but uh, they were, in a way, close. I profited from studying with Mr. Lepper and with Bruce Breland at the same time because their work uh, and their ideas were uh, congruent um, in a certain kind of way. They weren't parallel. They, they were both strong individuals. That is why I like them the most, but um, they did travel in parallel lines um, in, their, in their thinking in many respects and um, I had the advantage of working with two very smart people who were able to uh, help me along with uh, opening up my ideas and avenues towards self-expression that um, were under investigation in my own mind. It helped me quite a bit. And uh, my experience working with two of those very bright men uh, really did improve my life, and I'm thankful for it um, to this day. Bruce Breland would and, I, and I would have coffee and have lunch, sometimes dinner, um, almost every day, and uh, he would impart stories about 
uh, for instance, Roy Lichtenstein, who he knew very well, and uh, and how um, um, Alan Capro helped him um, gain access to Leo Castelli, uh, the particulars of how that happened, or he would explain uh, what happened when when uh, Bruce worked with Alan Capro and and Bruce filmed the first fluids piece in um, a mall parking lot in Los Angeles, uh, Bruce's photograph, um, photographs that documented that piece are now in the Getty Museum. And so that was pretty hefty stuff uh, to digest. He talked about uh, Black Mountain uh, and, uh, and how Rauschenberg um, uh, walked out on uh, Joseph Alpers because he didn't have a background, he didn't have a foreground. All this kind of stuff uh, was news to me, and um, and it was uh, an inside track on information that you don't get from people who really weren't there. Uh, Bruce liked um, Janis Joplin, Langston Hughes, William Faulkner, Waylon Jennings. He liked big rig truck drivers. He saw significance in the advent of uh, CB radio. Uh, we were both big fans of Marshall McLuhan, and and it bonded us. Um, we used to both make probes in the spirit of McLuhan all the time. Uh, it was fun, and uh, it was out front. Robert Lepper was uh, different. He was businesslike in his habits, very punctual. He went by the clock. If you wanted to uh, have a, um, a more focused discussion, he carried a black book, and you made an appointment. And uh, when the sweep hand hit 12, he walked through your door, sat down, and you had his undivided attention. Um, Bruce Breland was more casual than that, uh, but in a way his influence was just as deep with students. They would circle around him when he had dinner at Skibo and listen to his stories. And uh, there was a kind of cult following uh, around Bruce Breland because uh, he was uh, kind of special uh, in his uh, in his abilities to um, uh, to tell you um, inside information about uh, how the how the art work uh, the art world uh, actually worked. Per perhaps that's a good place to to pause um, this section. Um, and then we'll start up anew.